Good afternoon. It's great to see everyone. Thank you so much to the worship team. That was uh, very worshipful, very beautiful. And Kristen and Kayla, I know that's... Uh, it takes a lot to share like that, so thank you for sharing your testimony. It was really, really beautiful. And Jamie, we have another drummer named Jamie. Where is Jamie? I, dude, thank you so much for, for sharing with us and being willing to serve while you're down here on your, your vacation. I would like to start today in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. This, this might be, for me, the most difficult verse in the Bible. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always. Rejoice means to give joy to, to feel joy or great delight. But always, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. I wish I could say that this is me, but typically I rejoice when things are great. I give thanks when things are going well, and I usually pray when things are really bad. I find that it's dependent on my mood. How am I feeling at the moment? That defines how I act, or at least it has traditionally. Now, mood just means a conscious state of mind or predominant emotion. What is the predominant emotion of the moment? And I think it's a useful exercise um, for all of us to do, to kind of think about our mood um, just throughout the day, throughout the week. What, what kind of mood are we in? So I, I wanted to do this exercise. What does my mood look like on a daily basis? So <laughs> I was thinking about mood rings. I don't know if you've ever seen a mood ring popularized in the 70s and the 80s. They're really, actually, they're really neat. It's like a, it's a piece of quartz crystal that's been tuned to emit a certain color based on the temperature of the quartz. So if, it's, if the quartz is cold, it will turn black. If the quartz is really hot, it will turn this purplish, greenish, really cool looking color. But it's not really your mood. It's more how warm or cold are your hands. My hands are always hot, so it always says I'm in a great mood. <laughs> and uh, we know, I know that's not true. But the basic idea with this mood scale is if you're in the middle, you're kind of neutral. If you go up, up the scale, you're happier. And if you go down the scale, you're sad, you're sadder, right? So what is Eric's mood? I won't, we won't talk about everyone else's mood. We'll just talk about my mood. Well, I usually wake up, and I'm not usually in a very good mood. I'm kind of, I'm below, let's, let's, let's say in the neutral, I'm a little bit below neutral because I haven't had my caffeine yet. I'm hungry, so I get my caffeine, I eat, and I start to trend up the line, and then around lunchtime, I go and get more food, and I get even happier. I'm, I, 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 in doing this exercise, I, I realized that my mood was highly dependent on my caffeine level and my glucose level. But I tend to not, if you look at my average, I tend to be right in the middle. I'm not really happy. I'm not really sad. I'm just kind of neutral. You could even call it lukewarm. I, I, and this is nothing I did. This is just the way I was born. I'm sure my mom would agree with you that depressing things happen to me. I'm like, well, yeah, that's better luck next time. Really exciting things happen. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Justin loves that. Pretty good. No highs, no lows. Now, I know that's, that's just my personality. Um, and I know some, of, some people don't have that personality. Some people have giant swings. And that's okay. God made us all different. But then I took, I took this average and I said, well, how, do, how does my mood look like on a day-to-day? -day? And it turns out it doesn't really move much. You know, as the week goes on, I'm getting ready for the week. The week, work week's almost over, so I'm getting excited about not having to work. My mood's trending up. And as Sabbath rolls around, I get to go to church and be with the body, worship up a little more unless I happen to be scheduled for speaking that day. <laughs> but in general, my mood doesn't really change much. So the second most difficult verse, I think, for me in the Bible is James 1 and verse 2. 
My brethren, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is a, I guess this is honesty hour, because if I'm going through a trial, especially if it's a, re, I mean, a real trial. I'm usually not very, I'm usually not in a very good mood. I usually get really negative. If I'm hurting, I get, I get down. I can fall into negativity and gossip. So I find this, I find this verse really hard, particularly because I'm usually miserable. I have, I'm in a miserable mood if I'm in a real trial. About six years ago, I was out on my mom's farm, and after my dad died, I'd spent a lot of time out there. We, we, we were trying to clean up the place, get it ready to sell, which we finally, <laughs> praise God, we finally did. And I was out there, and there was this giant brush pile. Now, this brush pile, when I say giant, I want you to imagine a brush pile that's you know, the size of this stage plus half the room, okay, very large. And it had been there for years, and we just kept throwing more stuff on it. And it was on my to-do list. I am going to burn that brush pile. That is an eyesore. We need to get rid of that. So I decided uh, one week it had been raining that week. So I, I was worried. I didn't want to light it and then it get out of control. So I, I, I thought, oh, this is a good time. It's kind of wet. So I went out there. My, my brother and I went out there. We did all the things you're supposed to do. We built a little teepee. We sprayed it, you know, got lighter fluid all over it, lit it up. Burned for a little while, went out. Tried this a couple times. Now here's where the idiocy comes in. We ran out of lighter fluid. So he said, you know what? I've got a five gallon, gal a five gallon can of gasoline. So did the same thing. This time I'm gonna go big. I'm, I built a big TP out of dry wood. Just douse this thing with gasoline. I mean, douse, douse, douse. Now if you know anything about gasoline, it's not the liquid that's dangerous. As you pour gasoline out, fumes, a fume cloud emerges, right? You can't see it, you can smell it. That's why if you ever smell gas, it's bad, or gasoline. There's something wrong. But we had tried to light the fire, tried to light the fire, tried to light the fire, and I'm over here just dumping this gasoline out, not thinking that the fume cloud is growing. The fume cloud is growing. And so the fume cloud finally reached the hot coals, and it went up. Actually, you know the sound when you light like a gas stove, vomp. That's the sound it made, and I was on top of it. <laughs> so I got first-degree burns, really bad sunburn on the side of my face, on my hands, and I got second-degree burns from here all the way down. Actually, I have a, oh, yeah, the day, yeah, here we go. <laughs> so this was, this was a normal day. I woke up, I wasn't, you know, got my caffeine, went to lunch, I was hanging out with my brother, everything's good. Uh-oh. <laughs> Suddenly my mood, my mood changed dramatically. And it got worse. And thankfully, I, I, went, I was able to get in. Uh, I saw a doctor. He gave me uh, hydrocodone and tetanus shot and all the stuff you're supposed to get. This event, get off of that. Oh, I don't know why I have an average, but yeah, my average came down. This, I'm an engineer. I'm sorry. This event was sort of a... It, it sort of capped off a rough period in my life. It was a rough five years. Um, about five years previous to that, six years previous to that, um, I had been extremely blessed. Our whole family had been extremely blessed. I, I was 29 years old, and I still had all my grandparents. Who, who can say that? It's, it was, and I, I had great relationships with all of them. My grandmother... Uh, my mom, on my mom's side, she's still living. I still have a wonderful relationship with her. But at 29 years old, my, my first grandfather died. Maybe it was right around the same time, uh, the church where Chelsea and I met uh, out in East Texas, it went through a split. We had family on both sides of the split. A couple years later, my other grandfather died. The, the church we went to in Dallas went through a split, had friends on both sides of that split. My dad got diagnosed with cancer. For some reason, I decided to start a business on the side. I was working 20 to 30 hours a week at night. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. Did that for two years, and it failed. And I'm sure uh, Chelsea's 
a wonderful wife because we spent almost a car on this side business just for fun. It went away. My dad ended up passing away. And then the same year, my grandmother passed away. So in those five years, there was just a lot of stuff going on in me and a lot of compartmentalization. I'm really good at, uh, I think most men are pretty good at, I'm going to put this in this box over here. I'm not going to deal with that because I can't deal with that right now. There's a, a hilarious comedian. I should have wrote down his name, but if you Google, if you go to YouTube and search nothing box, it's, it's, really, it's a really good bit. But I'm compartmentalizing all this stuff all over the place. And then this event happens, this, this, uh, this accident. And I, you know, I, I don't really consider, I didn't really think that I was down during that time frame. I didn't, I didn't consider myself unhappy. I knew there was a lot of stuff going on. But this event just was the catalyst to just push me down. It pushed me down and I started thinking about, I was stuck at home. I've got this giant, if you, if you need help losing weight, ask Chelsea for pictures because she can provide them. It's disgusting. I mean, I had a bandage that went all the way down my arm and it had to be changed twice a day. Um, and I was stuck at home. For me, I'm a doer, like I like to do. The worst thing you can do is say, Eric, you can't do anything, just lay there. <laughs> lay there and think about what you've done. <laughs> um, and, and I did, you know what? And I didn't like it. And I kept thinking about what would my dad have said to me and just what all this craziness that was going on in my mind. So I was down on myself. I didn't want to be down. I wanted to be happy, but I was not. I was down. Now, happy, that's a strange term. It's kind of funny. I found in some Christian circles, the term happy or happiness actually isn't popular. It's not popular to be happy. I, I don't know why that is. I, I, I kind of wonder if it has something to do with like our American ideals, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Like, well, happiness is a fleeting feeling, but you should really focus on joy, having joy in Christ. I've heard the argument made, actually, if you just Google this, joy versus happiness, there are so many articles online, and a lot of them make this argument, well, joy is spiritual. Joy is spiritual, and happiness is temporal. It's worldly. You know, I kind of like the idea, but the thing is, we ourselves are temporal, of t temporal meaning of time and space. Even if you look at something like the spiritual gifts, the manifestation of spiritual gifts, the manifestation makes the gift temporal for a time, right? It's of time. So generally speaking, I find, I, I find this argument that somehow happiness and joy are, can't be the same or they're different. I find it problematic uh, for two reasons. And one is because I just can't find, you know, very simple biblical support for it. Now, there's a lot of really, you know, stand on your head, uh, mental gymnastic arguments for this concept, but I'm looking for simple. Now, I have a little exercise here for you guys. Happiness versus joy. Here are two definitions. One is for happiness, and one is for joy. I'll give you guys a second to read them. Well, I guess I should read them. The one on the left says, the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. The one on the right says, a state of well-being and contentment. We drop down to the second definition, a state of happiness or felicity, bliss, the one on the right, a pleasurable or satisfying experience. So which one is happiness and which one is joy? I tell you what, if you think it's the one on the left, any hands? Happiness? How about the one on the right? Is that happiness? Okay, we're about evenly divided. I got it wrong the first time. I thought it was opposite. Now, again, this is just Merriam-Webster. So this is in our modern vernacular, happiness and joy. If you go back and look at, for the word happiness, if you search the New King James for the word happiness, uh, you actually won't find it. It's, it's, only, it's only one time in the Old Testament. It's in the Hebrew. But in the Greek, it's not in there. It's the word for joy uh, is the same word for happiness. And the New King James writers, they didn't translate it 
not once. Now, if you go to other translations like NIV, they translate that same word sometimes into happiness, sometimes into joy. As a side note, the word, the Greek word for blessed is the same word as happy. So this is just an aside, but I wanted to point this out that I, I haven't been able to find super clear biblical rationale for this concept that these two things are different, that joy and happiness are different. And the second reason uh, that I don't really care for this concept is I think there can be unintended consequences, practical, uh, heart of the matter sort of issues that can come up. Many years ago, I worked at a company where uh, I worked with a lady, and you You've probably worked with someone like this yourself. I worked with a lady that she, she was not a happy person. Negativity all the time. She always had a scowl. She had a good way of wrecking a meeting because you could go into a meeting and everyone's cheery and everyone leaves down, right? Right? And, you know, the rumors were, well, you know, she's had a rough life. Um, her husband cheated on her, and she doesn't have a good marriage, and her kids don't like her, and she's got health problems, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, all these reasons why she wouldn't be happy, why she would basically be, you know, unhappy. The thing about her, though, that was f very frustrating, and I did, this is not a lady I knew well, but I, I knew of her and sat through a couple of meetings with her. But if you go and look at her desk, if you go and look at her cube, she's got crosses hanging up all over the place. She's got devotionals. And she was very vocal about having joy in the Lord. So she's toxic to be around. She's constantly spewing negativity but she's got joy in her heart. Does that make sense? And I think I've actually known multiple people that are kind of like her, and, and, and I think this kind of fits into some of the broader discussions that are going on right now in our society. Look, this is just who I am. You're going to have to deal with it. You have to be true to yourself, right? Don't hide your feelings. So... Okay, so she's going to treat everyone poorly and simultaneously say joy to the Lord. Matthew 5 and verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So this lady, unfortunately, I haven't kept up with her. I don't know. I, ho I hope she's turned it around. But she wasn't a light. She was a black hole. And she'd suck the joy out of the room. So I'd, I'd like to pause for a second and, and talk about a really, really serious issue. And, and that's, you, you know, all these depressions. We talk about this mood scale. Like God made us this way, right? We have this spectrum of emotion. If something sad, if something depressing, terrible happens to you, you should be sad. If you're not sad when something terrible happens, then something's wrong. And likewise, and this, I'm speaking to myself here, if something great happens, you should be excited. Shout for joy. Raise your hands. I don't like to do that. Oh, reserved. We know there are seasons in life. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1. I ran out of time, so I don't have these on the slide deck. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time for peace. 
So again, we have, there's a time, there's a season, there's a time and you should be sad. If you're not, you know, uh, then your emotions, you're, something's not right. But here's what I want to say. If you find yourself, I can't point the laser pointer at the TV, but if you find yourself stuck, if you find yourself stuck down at the bottom of this mood scale and you're depressed for weeks or months or years, that is not what God intended for you. And you need to seek professional help. Professional help. There are five, the stats for 2020 say that there are, uh, let's see, percent of aged adults 18 and over with regular feelings of depression. They call it chronic depression. 5% of the country. This is for America, for the U.S. That's one in 20 people. Additionally, if you get so low, you're stuck in this, you're stuck in this box, you can't get out, and you start having suicidal thoughts or thoughts of self-harm. You need to seek help immediately. And I don't mean when you feel better, you're going to call someone. I mean today. You need to find someone that you trust, and you need to tell them, and you need to get help. And if someone comes and tells you this, if someone trusts you enough to tell you this, help them. Help them. Find professional help. 46,000 46, people in 2020 died by suicide. That statistic blows my mind. That's one death every 11 minutes. That means in the time that we've been here, since 1 o'clock, we've had six suicides in America. So please tell someone, don't wait. Chronic depression, it is a disease. There's a lot of people that have a, a chemical imbalance. It, sometimes it's genetic. It, there is no shame. You, you, you know, I'm, I'm a big... Uh, this sounds terrible, but I'm a big believer that if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. But if it kills you, it doesn't make you stronger. Really? Right? I mean, tell someone. So what, much of what I'm about to say may not necessarily apply if, you're, if you are having chronic depression. What I'm about to say may not necessarily apply to you. I hope it's beneficial. I hope you can get something out of it, but it doesn't necessarily apply. So, with everything I've said, I, I, I think this sort of leaves me with two, two questions when we're talking about mood. The first question is, how can we change our mood? Is there a way we can change our mood? And the second question is, how much should our mood affect our demeanor, meaning our behavior towards others, our outwardly manner? For me, if I'm being honest, again, I've been very honest with you guys, and thankfully I didn't break down up here because I was worried about that. But for me, for most of my life, my mood was my outwardly demeanor. They are one and the same. So let's start with changing our mood. So I spent a considerable amount of time reading papers and articles and reading, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of people that are unhappy, so that means there's a lot of content online about changing your mood. And so I, I found a bunch of different things, some from psychologists, psychiatrists. I tried to distill it all down into eight different ways, simple things that we can do to change our mood or at least influence it. So the first thing we can do is we can practice gratitude. If you would, turn over to Colossians 3 and verse 15. Colossians 3 and verse 15. And let... And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Um, the, the science backs up this whole gratitude thing. It's, it's really amazing. I, I don't know if you've ever tried to do this, but you know, I, I've, I've, the last few years, I will sometimes just, I'm not praying, I'm not saying anything, I'm not even thinking anything. I try not to think. I'll just look up to God, look up to the sky and just smile. Thank you, God, for the blessings you've given to me. James 1, James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. 
Every good gift comes from above. You know, if you start putting gratitude in perspective on what the Father has done for us without the Father, I mean, we are truly dust. We are dirt. We are animated earth. Everything, everything we have is, we we should be so grateful. Something else that's, uh, that's helped me sometimes. Uh, I, I, Kristen, I thought your thing about GPS was great uh, because I, I used to be into geography. Um, not used to be. I guess I sort of am into geography. But when I was in high school, I was fascinated with maps. And um, I was so excited when Yahoo Maps came out and then later Google Maps. Like, what an awesome thing, you know? This is back when you had to print it and take it with you. And then if you have to turn down a street that you didn't have the printout, you're like, oh boy, I'm in trouble. (laughs) But shortly after Google Maps came out, they came out with something called Google Street View. And I'm sure you guys have seen this. But Google Street View allows you to drop, you know, you're you're navigating through some place and you can actually click a button and it will show you a picture of the street. You know, the little Google car drives around, it's taking photos of everything. When that launched, that launched in one city, I think it was LA. And they've slowly added cities over time. I mean, this has been almost 20 years now. But now, South America, Africa, parts of China, parts of Russia, they've all been mapped with these Google cards. And it's it's actually really cool because you want to go see what's going on in Russia, you know, whenever the car drove by. It's fascinating. You can drop a pin and you can see, well, what does that street look like? But this is a really good tool for me, especially when I feel, oh, woe is me, Eric, poor Eric. Go down to South America somewhere. Just pick a random spot. It doesn't have to be calculated. Go to Africa. Go to the Middle East. Drop a pin. What you're going to see is that we live like kings. We, have, we don't have dirt roads. Where's the, Wal- where's the CVS? Where's the Walgreens? Why are these people, why don't they have shoes on? Now, of course, that's not everywhere. But if you do this exercise, you'll be shocked. And it just, it, it's, and for me, this just reminds me of just how truly grateful I am, not only to be alive, but to live in America. Number two, we can worship and we can pray. First Thessalonians 5 Verse 16, this is the same verse we started with. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, the prayer, the prayer thing, I, I, the, by the way, these, uh, these are not in any particular order, but I started with gratitude because I think sometimes it's important to when you pray to be thankful and to be, practice gratitude in prayer. And I, and I think it's interesting, too, because a lot of times we already know. God knows what we need. God knows what we've got. God knows everything. He knows it before we ask for it. The question is, do we know what to pray for? There's this concept uh, in psychology called ideation. And it's the, 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 uh, what it means is you conceptualize a mental image. And ideation is actually one of the reasons when, if you start having negative thoughts, thoughts of self-harm, you, you are taking that, you're taking that sort of abstract idea and you're making it real in your mind. And, and you're, maybe you're breaking down the mental barriers that are in your way to ex- executing what that idea is. It's very powerful to think through things like that. But, so in the case of self-harm, it's very bad. But it also is very good if you have... Uh, you know, in terms of prayer, in terms of positive thinking, if you have to sit down and pray, hey, I want, I'll, let's pray. Let, you know, this might be a good mental exercise for all of us later. Pray for things that you're grateful for. Well, maybe you hadn't thought about it. But if you actually conceptualize in your mind all the things that you've been given, all the things, all the ways that God has blessed you in your life, and you have to say those out loud, This is a very powerful way for you to take the abstract and make it real. And God already knew. But now you you know because you had to pray. Colossians 4 and verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful in it with thanksgiving. 
Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and, a bride, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. And I love this imagery here. Can you think of a happier day than a bridegroom and a bride? And then Hebrews 13, 15. Through him, let us continue, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. The fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So worship and prayer. Number three, practice selflessness. The, the, the science has shown this over and over and over. If you serve someone with no desire for anything in return, if you do something selfless, you will feel better. It's amazing. I mean, and there's so many opportunities to serve. I mean, Chelsea just talked about this volunteer survey that's being sent out. It doesn't have to be at Oak Stone. It could be anywhere. It could be a food pantry. There's so many opportunities. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Again, it, it's, I, I have seen this in my own life. I can go and serve in some capacity, and I may leave exhausted, but I leave filled, fulfilled. It is such a powerful thing to serve. Make social connections. First Peter 4 and verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So again, we, you know, if you think about the body, there's so many opportunities for social connection. But it doesn't have to be within the body. You know, call, call a loved one. Call an old friend. Um, text somebody that you haven't texted in a while. And, and those social connections, they just, again, this is a, a scientific thing. They, they have found that when you make those connections and you interact with people, it will build you up. Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to, good, to love and good works. Not de- neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. I, I, I know I've, I've brought up this verse multiple times. Every time, it seems like every time I come up here I say this because people in our society, we're isolating ourselves more and more Every opportunity we get, we're trying to isolate. I don't know how you do that. This verse, not neglecting to meet together. So stop the isolating. It's not healthy. We are not meant to be alone in this world. Romans 1, verse 12. That is that we, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Again, the whole, one of the primary roles of the body is to encourage each other, to build each other up, to bear each other's burdens. Making social connections is such an important thing. It's so important to laugh. Uh, when we were at David and Amy's, by the way, David and Amy, I don't know if you guys are on, but I hope you're feeling better. We were at David and Amy's uh, baby shower two weeks ago, and Steve Keener made a crack, made a joke, and I don't know why. That has stuck with me for, <laughs> for days, that stuck with me. Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. That's not a, that's not a phrase I use very often, dries up the bones. The power of laughter is just, it's unbelievable. But it goes both ways, right? 
it can, it can edify and it can build up, or you can be a crushed spirit and you can dry up everyone's bones. So sometimes Chelsea has picked up on this trait of mine, and sometimes when we're driving and I'm not, uh, maybe I'm, I haven't had my food, you know, because for me it's all about food. I haven't had my food, and I'm getting hangry, and she picks up on it, so she'll turn on a Christian comedian. Doesn't say anything. Just Here's the Christian comedian, and it helps. It does. A joyful heart is good medicine. Practice a hobby. Now, sometimes hobbies are, are, are kind of looked down upon, I think, in, in, in some Christian circles. Uh, you know, maybe... Oh, you know, that doesn't have any economic value. So you're just wasting your time. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 24. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or or who can have enjoyment? And then following up in Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. For what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So, I mean... I think there's value in finding a hobby that brings you joy. I mean, everything in moderation, right? But if it brings you joy, I, I, I'm fascinated by, uh, if, if you go through and, and look, just, just uh, search the Bible for the word music. I mean, it, it is chock full of verses about music, about all the different... Some people think music is a worth, worthless hobby, and it doesn't mean you have to do music to, so that you can come up here and play. You can play to God. Or maybe you can take up a, a music, a, a music, a hobby like the guitar, and maybe use that as, as an opportunity to, to socialize, to, you know, join a group, join a, um, some local organization that, that does things with guitars, or maybe it's sewing or whatever. It's an opportunity to spread the gospel. Now, this, this particular one has helped me tremendously. Avoiding sources of negativity. Philippians 4 and verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Colossians 3 and verse 1, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. But avoiding... Avoiding sources of negativity, you know, I, sometimes there are people that you can't avoid. Maybe, maybe you live with them. But you can make a mental decision that you are not going to let their, their negativity influence you, and you are going to try to build them up. And if you can, you know, minimize the time with that person. But most of the time, we can avoid the negativity. We just choose not to because it's kind of fun, right? It's kind of fun to join in and Talk about the boss or whatever. Another source of negativity that has helped me a lot, and I know this is not, I'm, this is not going to be a popular statement, but if you've got 24-hour news, please turn it off. I, I listen to the news for about 10 minutes every day, and I feel like I'm fairly well informed. <laughs> if you listen to that same 10 minutes of news for 24 hours, you're going to be in a really bad mood. Well, Eric, you know, I don't listen to 24-hour news. I'm, uh, this conspiracy theory website's my favorite. Someone show me a conspiracy theory that's positive, and then I'll read about it. But until then, I don't want to hear it. 
Don't want to hear it. Because they're all, it's all about negativity. It's all just bring, it's just different ways of bringing us down, right? There's a big bad group of people out there. There's nothing you can do about it, but it's bad. We should read about it. We should set our mind on Christ and think about ways that we can uplift and edify one another. And that's getting ahead of myself. The last item here, look to Jesus. Look to his example. What would Jesus do? Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking, in, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, he died for us. He was our, he's our savior. We should want to emulate him and look to him. I don't think if you're emulating Jesus, he's going to be the guy in the meeting talking bad about everybody else and bringing everybody down. He's not going to be the, the negative one. He's going to be the guy building everybody up. So my first question was, can we influence our mood? And I think we all know that we can. We absolutely can. But the second question was, how much should our mood affect our demeanor? You know, we are human, and I don't think it is going to be very difficult to fully escape your mood, to fully escape it. But look at this list. Notice every single item on that list is an action. We practice gratitude. We worship, we pray, we practice selflessness, we make social connections, we laugh, we practice a hobby, we avoid sources of negativity, we look to Jesus. They're all actions. Psychologists call this behavioral activation. We don't feel like doing anything, especially if we're depressed. We feel like just lounging around and wallowing. But that's exactly the time we need to go out and do and act. So now we're not really talking about changing our mood. Now we're talking about changing our demeanor. And the concept behind this behavioral activation is, is that if you change your demeanor, if you change what you do, oftentimes your mood will follow. So I'll come back to this slide. This has more or less been my life for the last 30, 40 years, right? But my goal for the last three, my goal pretty much since starting Oak Stone, is that my demeanor, while it still may roughly track my mood, it is not going to be my mood. My goal is to have a positive demeanor anytime I can. A quick comment. Um, I've heard before, I've read, I've heard people say something along the lines of, well, Eric, aren't you saying, aren't you, aren't you advocating that, that people should be fake? I mean, I have to be real. I have to be genuine. I have to, I have to be true to myself. In thinking about this, uh, I came across a scripture, and I read it in sort of a new way that I hadn't really fully thought about before. And I, and I did this because, again, my mood is, generally speaking, based on food. So when is, the, when is Eric in the worst mood? Well, atonement. <laughs> Anytime I need to fast... And I don't fast nearly enough because I mean, it makes me in such a bad mood. <laughs> but Matthew 6, 16. Matthew 6, 16. 
Moreover, when you fast, oh, he's talking to me. When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. Wow. But to your father who is in the secret place, your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, this is, I, I think this is fascinating. Do not be like the hypocrite. What is hypocrite? One who assumes a false appearance. One who feigns to be what he is not or to believe or feel what he does not actually believe or feel, especially a, a false pretender to virtue or piety. So Jesus is telling us not to be like the hypocrites who are, have a false appearance. But then the very next verse says, you should put on a good face. Again, I can't think of a time when I'm in a worse mood than atonement. And here Jesus is telling me, no one should know that I'm fasting. This really, this speaks to me because this is exactly my situation. Anyway, I think this is a really interesting scripture and I think it's worth considering. Life, no doubt about it, life is hard. You know, all the things I, I listed earlier, uh, you know, people die. Something dad used to say, nobody makes it out alive. We don't. We don't make it out. We're all, fine. We're all just dust, and we're going to go back to dust. So we, we shouldn't be surprised when people die. It's, of course, it's sad. But life is full of sadness. It's full of joy, but it's full of sadness. But that's one of the reasons that we have this body, to build each other up, to be there for each other. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So we've got this responsibility to the body, but we also have another responsibility, that of the Great Commission, to be Christ's hands and feet to spread the gospel. Matthew 28 Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. So, you know, in conclusion, we can call it happiness. We can call it joy. We can call it mood. The, the bottom line is that our demeanor, how we treat people, is absolutely key to our two roles, serving the body and fulfilling the Great Commission. Philippians 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let's rejoice.